Hello, good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight. I'm Roger Johnson. Our top story. Shame, stigma and financial ruin. Former postmasters explain the impact of their wrongful convictions in the post office scandal. We live in a caravan, we couldn't get a mortgage. Luckily we didn't go bankrupt because my daughter lent us some money. We lost everything. We will hear from the Preston IT expert who told the post office its system was faulty more than 20 years ago. Also tonight, Emergency beds in a former school as Salford declares a homelessness crisis. High hopes for cleaner energy as the region's first hydrogen production plant gets the go-ahead. A tall order, how Chester Zoo doesn't monkey about when it comes to keeping its animals warm in winter. And while it's been pretty settled over the last few days, mostly cloudy skies but dry weather, there will be some changes as we go into the weekend and next week. I'll bring you the full details at the end of the programme. Some of the region's victims of the post office scandal, which has been making headlines for a week or so now, have told us today about the impact that their wrongful convictions have had on their lives. Words such as shame and stigma have been used, while one has described having to wear an electronic tag, and another reveals, as you heard at the beginning of the programme, that she now lives in a caravan after losing her home. Katie Barnfield has this report. For many victims of the post office scandal, the toll it has taken has been unbearable. From bankruptcy to wrongful imprisonment, livelihoods and lives ruined. My name is Scott Darlington. I ran Alderley Edge Post Office. I was suspended in 2009, convicted in 2010. Um, I couldn't get a job for three and a half years after that. I couldn't afford to pay for my daughter's school uniform. I had to wear a tag for uh, three months and had a suspended sentence for 12 months. I've carried the shame ever since. I refuse to carry it any longer. The Horizon computer system was introduced by the post office in 1999, but faults in the system made it look like money had gone missing when it hadn't. More than 700 branch managers were wrongly convicted of fraud, theft and false accounting. Some were forced to pay thousands out of their own pockets. Others took their own lives. Amanda Barber ran Thelwall Post Office in Warrington before her conviction in 2012. She and her husband Norman lost their home after paying £200,000 for a shortfall that never existed. Well, it ruined our lives. We lost the house, we lost the business, we lost family. They stopped talking to us when this happened. Um, now we live in a caravan, we couldn't get a mortgage. We were told when we went to court we were the only ones that this had happened to. And it was only seeing a documentary on telly about four years ago through um, Panorama that we realised there was other people. Today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced plans for a new law, which he says will swiftly exonerate and compensate victims. We will also introduce a new upfront payment of £75,000 for the vital GLO group of postmasters. We will make sure that the truth comes to light, we right the wrongs of the past and the victims get the justice they deserve. But for some, like Graham Livesey, who lost thousands at his post office in Staveley and Cumbria, it's too little, too late. What we've been through over the last decade um, is it's just unforgivable. Um, and no, no amount of, of money will help. You can't turn back the clock. An ITV drama series which came out last week helped trigger the government's latest response. This is the 91st time I've called you about these shortfalls. But many of those whose lives were destroyed can't understand why it took so long. Katie Barnfield, BBC Northwest Tonight. Well, an IT expert from Preston was one of the first to look at the Horizon system. He has since supported Alan Bates and other postmasters and mistresses in their fight with the post office. And he's given evidence to the public inquiry into the scandal. Jason Coyne's his name. He wrote that first report about problems at Cleveleys near Blackpool. He wrote it on behalf of the post office. He found Horizon to be faulty. I asked him how his client reacted. Well, they initially come back and said that they was quite disappointed uh, with the report uh, and asked whether there was anything 
uh, that might persuade me uh, to, to alter my opinion. And they showed me a witness statement of one of the uh, post office uh, internal auditors who was said to have looked at the system and said that there's no problems that were found with the system. Uh, and I said in my report that that was, that was clearly incorrect. And there was an email that, that you've seen that, that came out into the inquiry that basically said, throw money at it, get a confidentiality agreement signed and make the whole thing go away. Yeah, so, so there was dialogue between post office and Fujitsu trying to find uh, additional evidence that they could present to me to try and persuade me to alter my opinion. But the conclusion of uh, post office's legal team uh, in consultation with Fujitsu is, quote, uh, the safest way is to throw money at this and get a confidentiality agreement signed to keep it out of the public domain. Um, and then they went on to say, the real question is how much money to go away and shut up? And now, I, I don't think that was focused at me. I think that was focused at the uh, uh, at the Cleveland's um, sub post mistrust. Uh, but I mean, essentially, I I was stood down uh, shortly after um, serving serving my report, and I do understand that the matter was settled. What would have happened if the post office had trusted what you told them and acted on your findings? Would we have avoided the appalling miscarriage of justice that en ensued over the following decade, two decades? I mean, I certainly think that, it, that, that if the post office uh, would have seen the gravity of what I was saying, and fundamentally, the, the biggest issue um, that they could have addressed was to first look at the system first rather than looking to the sub-postmaster to settle any issues with discrepancy in their, in, in their branch accounts. But there was a fundamental disillusionment, essentially, within the post office, uh, that the computer system wasn't faulty. And going from that fundamentally flawed basis came the result of the, of, of the prosecution decisions. Have you watched the drama? I have indeed. Did yes. any of it surprise you? Um, what, what really surprised me and, and, and touched me is that um, I'd, I'd encountered mo mo most of the, uh, the sub postmasters and mistresses that appeared in the drama during uh, the Bates litigation. I, I got to meet them. They, they were thoroughly nice people. But at that point in time, I'd only looked at the cases effectively on, on, on paper. You know, they, they, they were numbers. They were fault logs. They was. It was call logs, so, so to meet them in person... There's a human story uh, behind everything. There's a human story, yeah. It, it, was, it, it was absolutely incredible and very, and, and, and very moving, very moving. What have you made of the reaction to the drama? Well, I, I think it's fantastic that the drama uh, has brought on the reaction that it has, that we might finally get to the stage uh, that this matter can be, can be put, put behind us. But equally, I'm so sad that a lot of this could have been avoided if fundamental decisions were taken in the very, very early days of, of Horizon. Um, you know, certainly back in 2003 with, 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 with the problems that, were, that, that, that I pointed out. Jason Coyne, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Now, car journeys in Manchester and Liverpool are among the slowest in the country because of the number of 20 miles an hour speed limits on local roads. The sat-nav company TomTom Tom, says a six-mile trip in Manchester takes an average of over 23 minutes, with Liverpool not far behind, unless it's stuck in a jam, I guess. Uh, insufficient planning around care homes and a lack of attention to children's educational recovery were among the issues identified in a review of how the Isle of Man dealt with COVID. An independent inquiry has made several recommendations, but says the government's handling of the pandemic on the island was largely successful. The North West has got more child abuse cases than anywhere else in the country, according to the National Crime Agency. There were nearly 6,000 reported to Greater Manchester Police alone in the last year. That's a rise of nearly 50%. And the police say that up to half the offences are committed by under-18s who are sharing indecent pictures on smartphones. And today marks five years since our friend, your friend, and our colleague Diane Oxberry died. Diane's legacy lives on, though, through the work of the ovarian cancer charity formed in her name, the Diane Oxberry Trust. 
Now, emergency accommodation has been set up in Salford as the council says that it is facing a homelessness crisis. Growing numbers of asylum seekers are having applications approved by the government, the authority claims, and that means that they have to leave temporary accommodation with nowhere to go. So the council is now using an old school as a shelter, as Phil McCann reports. This is not how homeless people are meant to be housed. It's airbeds, it's sleeping bags, it's pillows, it's, in my opinion, it's Dickensian, to be honest with you. This is a reminder of where we were when homelessness and rough sleeping originally became a problem here in Greater Manchester. Your accommodation and... for homeless people is, is Dickensian? Absolutely. I mean, it's not ideal. The reason it's not ideal, it's been done really quickly. Salford City Council says it's had a surge of people facing sleeping rough over the last few weeks. Like James, which isn't his real name, who's from Salford. Well, obviously it's not perfect, you know, it's, there's not um, great facilities, but it's warm, you've got a bed for the night. There are no showers here and no real privacy. Uh, but this is what the council says it's been driven to. 34 people have been staying here over the last few nights. The vast majority were in asylum seeker accommodation and have now had their applications approved. And that means that after 28 days, they can no longer stay in the houses, rooms and hotels like this that asylum seekers have been staying in. The government's been trying to clear a huge backlog of asylum applications that have been waiting for more than a year and a half. They have cleared most of them and far more were granted than were turned down. The Home Office literally is evicting people from their homes and making it local authorities' responsibility whilst knowing we don't have accommodation. And in Liverpool, the City Council's written to the government asking for urgent help to deal with what it says is an unprecedented rise in homelessness, also caused, it says, by a spike in British citizens being evicted because they can't pay their rent. The end result is there's not enough places for people to stay. You know, if you, if you go from somewhere like this and then you're granted somewhere else, where do you go from there? Because there's not enough social housing for people anyway, so where does everybody go? The government insists it does provide support to migrants, including advice on how to access benefits, work and where to get help with housing. They say they're working with local authorities to manage the impact of asylum decisions. Councils like Salford, though, say that impact is getting much bigger. Phil McCann, BBC Northwest Tonight, Salford. Now, an inquest jury has decided that a 15-month-old boy who died of sepsis at the Countess of Chester Hospital received inadequate care and would probably have survived if the proper tests had been carried out. Ollie Stopforth from Frodsham died in 2020, and tonight his parents said that he was failed by all doctors at all levels. Andy Gill sent this from Warrington Coroner's Court. Ollie Stopforth became ill with a rash, a high temperature and a high heart rate. A GP thought he might have a viral infection. But paramedics called after he became worse, thought he might have sepsis, a bacterial infection which is much more serious. Ollie was taken to the Countess of Chester Hospital. But there, nothing was done to specifically rule out bacterial infection and there was no comprehensive plan for reassessment. The hospital did not follow national guidelines which could have shown the need for a blood test. Ollie spent six hours in A&E before being transferred to a ward. He was then discharged but died at home two days later. The jury decided that at the hospital the communication, the information and the testing was inadequate. All this happened in March 2020, at the start of the pandemic. But the jury said it is accepted that whilst COVID-19 was amending the way things were done, the overall level of care that Ollie received was inadequate. And had tests been undertaken to identify a bacterial infection, Ollie's survival would have been highly likely. After the inquest, a solicitor read out a statement on behalf of Ollie's parents, Laura and Carl. When Ollie arrived at hospital, he was a very sick baby. <laughs> he was not properly assessed. He was not given basic medical attention. He was not prioritised or regarded as important. He was not kept safe. He was failed by all doctors at all levels. 
In a statement read by the coroner after the inquest, the trust which runs the Countess of Chester Hospital said it has improved things since Ollie's death, including now using the national guidelines on sepsis testing. The coroner, Jacqueline Devonish, said her sincere hope was that the Countess of Chester has learned serious lessons from Ollie's death. Andy Gill, BBC Northwest Tonight at Warrington Coroner's Court. Now, figures which have been released in the past couple of hours by the NHS show that over 25,000 hospital appointments had to be cancelled because of the junior doctor strike at the beginning of the month. That six-day strike, of course, ended on Tuesday morning yesterday. It followed another one which came a fortnight earlier, all this at the busiest time of year for the NHS. Jill Dummigan, our health correspondent, has been crunching these numbers quite quickly, I have to say, Jill. Give us some of the main details that you've found. Well, let's start by looking at the number of staff days that our hospitals lost to these strikes because it was many thousands. For that strike at the end of December, it was more than 10,500 days. That doesn't include staff at any of Liverpool's hospitals as that data wasn't submitted. January's strike was twice as long and so obviously it's more, nearly 17,000 recorded absences, although that doesn't include three trusts, so it will have been far higher. In total, there are more than 27,500 days lost there. Now, obviously, that's going to have a huge impact on the hospital's ability um, to treat patients. We've got those figures too. I've added both months together in this case and it comes to more than 2,000 inpatient appointments being cancelled and more than 23,000 outpatient appointments, so over 25,000 in all. Some trusts were hit harder than others. Manchester University cancelling by far the greatest number of inpatient appointments, around 500, although it's a huge trust treating the whole of that city, so that's not surprising. Counties of Chester and Wirral Hospital uh, trusts seem to be quite badly affected as well. So all this means there are now tens of thousands of appointments, of appointments that need fitting into a system that is already bursting at the seams. That's right, yes. I've been talking to Dr Paula Gowan. And she's one of the region's medical directors and she was pointing out the fact that, of course, we're still getting over all those uh, appointments that were cancelled during COVID. That coupled now with industrial action where appointments had to be moved, where procedures had to be rearranged, we will be following that up for, for a period of time. And... So when we talk about industrial action and, and the, the, the days of the industrial action, the pressure that that has, that knock-on effect is felt across the system. Now, of course, this comes in the middle of winter, always a difficult time for the NHS, also in the middle of a big problem with long waiting lists. The most recent figures we've got there are actually from October last year, and they showed more than a million people in this region waiting for treatment, nearly seven and a half, uh, sorry, 74,500 of them waiting a year or more, and nearly 1,500 of them waiting for more than a year and a half. Now, having said that, the number of people waiting for those long periods, particularly people waiting longer than a year and a half, has actually gone down significantly since uh, January of last year. Um, the new figures, though, out tomorrow morning, then we'll also be looking at A&E wait times, how hospital, uh, full hospitals are the whole picture, so I think I will be back here tomorrow <laughs> evening. See you tomorrow. It's a day to Jill. Thank you very much. Jill Dumming in there. A bit of football news, some sad news, I'm afraid. The former owner and chairman of Everton and Tranmere Rovers, Peter Johnson's, died at the age of 84. A prominent businessman for several decades, he helped Tranmere to achieve two promotions and he was at Everton when they won the FA Cup in 1995. On the pitch, Liverpool hosts Fulham in the first leg of their League Cup semi-final tonight, of course, without Mo Salah, who's on international duty. Trent Alexander-Arnold is injured in rugby league. St Helens stalwart James Roby is joining the coaching staff after finishing a 20-year playing career at his hometown club. He'll do one-to-one -one coaching and mentoring with the squad. The UK's first large-scale, low-carbon hydrogen plant is to be built here at the Stanlow Refinery in Cheshire after planning permission was approved. The energy company SR says that it will be producing hydrogen for use in industry across the northwest by 2027, and it claims that that will be a game-changer in our drive to cut carbon emissions. As our environment correspondent Judy Hobson reports. Stanlow Oil Refinery produces billions of tonnes of diesel, petrol and jet fuel every year and as a result its carbon footprint is huge. But within three years this area could be transformed. Permissions now being given to build the UK's biggest low carbon hydrogen plant here. It's really the scale of this one 
that's so important. We are the first, the most advanced, low carbon at scale hydrogen production facility in the UK, which makes us one of the most advanced in the world right now. We're going to be producing over one gigawatt of low carbon hydrogen. That's enough energy to power a city the size of Liverpool, just up the road. And in doing so, we will capture around 2 million tonnes a year of carbon dioxide. That's carbon dioxide emissions that are going into the atmosphere today. Natural gas can be split into hydrogen and CO2. SR says it will capture the CO2 and bury it under Liverpool Bay. As well as powering the refinery, the hydrogen will be used in local industry and the first to come online will be this one. NSERC makes 40% of the country's glass bottles and jars. You think wine bottles, beer bottles, spirits. What we do is we make them here, we make two billion bottles on this particular site every year. We fill a lot of them, then we put them in your local supermarket. Its two gas furnaces are the biggest in the world. It uses natural gas for heating, but this releases tonnes of carbon. So we think we can phase in hydrogen over the rest of this decade, test the hydrogen on our furnaces and slowly decarbonise our furnaces. Then later on in the decade, perhaps in the early 2030s, we believe we can create ultra-low carbon glass, perhaps even in the future, zero carbon glass using sustainable fuels such as hydrogen. SR says it hopes to eventually produce green hydrogen at scale where no CO2 is emitted, but says this new plant will put the region at the forefront of the UK's journey to net zero. Judy Hobson, BBC Northwest Tonight, Stanlow. Now, this fellow doesn't live far from there. Uh, with millions of people flocking there every year, Chester is the most visited zoo in the UK. Uh, this is a quieter time of year, of course, but the keepers are as busy as ever keeping the 20,000 animals warm enough during the winter months. He'd need quite a long scarf, I suspect. Uh, Juliet Phillips has been to find out more. They're more naturally suited to the sunny climes of Africa than chilly Chester, so it's vital these giraffes are kept warm over the winter. So this is one of our hotbeds for the giraffes. Keeper Rosie showed me the slightly surprising way they manage it here at Chester Zoo. So a hotbed's not a normal straw bed. Um, we layer it up with their own poo and straw. Basically, the poo will break down and bring and right, the heat will rise to the surface. So a warmer bed, but maybe a bit smellier bed in the winter. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, we're used to it, obviously. Over in the monsoon forest, the animals aren't affected by the colder outdoor temperatures. It's kept hot and humid here to recreate the climate of Southeast Asia. But all that heat comes at a cost. The electricity bill is around £3 million a year, which is obviously very significant. So what we're trying to do now is move towards much more sustainable ways of heating you know, these tropical environments, so moving to things like um, air source heat pumps, um, PV, solar PV panels, um, becoming a lot more sustainable in the way we operate. Here at Chester Zoo, they have around 2 million visitors per year. It's a little bit quieter over these winter months, but the keepers are kept busy all year round. This one here is Marmite. I can just show you. I caught up with Ellie while she was checking on the Tuataras. These reptiles are extremely rare. Chester Zoo have the only breeding group outside New Zealand. They look like a lizard, but they're actually not. They're more like a living fossil, so they've been split from other reptiles since the time of the dinosaurs. They aren't currently on show to the public, and it's a good job. During the winter, they need their peace and quiet. Brumation is more of a kind of aware state of hibernation, so if you disturb them, they will move, but otherwise they'll just stay very still where they are, not expending any energy, um, and they don't need feeding. They'll remain in the state of reptile hibernation until March. Juliet Phillips, BBC Northwest Tonight, Chester. Right, the animals keeping warm at Chester Zoo. They're not the only ones that are feeling the cold at the moment, Simon, are they? Absolutely not, and uh, it's going to turn it even chillier as we go into next week, actually. So, mm. um, yeah, certainly scarves, hats, gloves, all that will be needed. Certainly today, it's been pretty chilly once again. We've had quite extensive cloud across the northwest. Only a few glimmers of sunshine, such as this in Hartford in Cheshire. So, some sunny spells, and really that's the exception rather than the rule. So, over the next few days, it will stay largely cloudy. A few bright spells here and there, dry 
also quite chilly. Through tonight, little change really. We're going to see quite a bit of cloud, maybe one or two light showers over the Pennines. They should stay over the tops of the Pennines really. Uh, with some clearer spells, temperatures getting close to freezing. So we could see a touch of frost first thing on Thursday towards Cheshire, Greater Manchester. Further north, perhaps a bit more cloud around, keeping those temperatures above freezing. But throughout Thursday, lots of cloud again. Some breaks in the clouds, particularly towards the uh, west of the Pennines here, or the north Pennines, so for parts of Lancashire, Cumbria and the Isle of Man will get some sunnier skies. Temperatures perhaps a degree or so higher than they've been in the recent couple of days, but temperature still 7 or 8 degrees. High pressure is the reason why the weather is so settled. It's going to stick around for Friday. Slap bang right across the UK, so light winds. And we're just chasing cloud around, really. So during Friday, again, fairly cloudy skies, perhaps a greater chance of seeing some, uh, some brightness, a few sunnier skies developing into the afternoon. Again, the Isle of Man getting some sunshine as well. Temperatures on Friday, about 5 to 7 degrees Celsius. But that big area of high pressure will start to clear away as we go into the weekend. So it almost disappears. And then we start to see one or two weather fronts moving in from the north. And that means we're going to see some colder conditions as we go through the weekend and into next week. And interestingly, we've got some mild air moving in. Now, as that mild air bashes into that colder air, there's the potential for some snow, pot potentially significant snow in the middle part of next week. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on that one, Roger. Significant snow? Potentially. So what's yes. that mean? Quite widespread snow. So quite a good part of England and Wales might get some snow. But not deep. Potentially, Ooh. yeah. But the uncertainty is how far north it might be, whether it comes into our area, but we'll see. Thanks for watching on that note. <laughs> Have a right. good night. Bye -bye.